Hello. 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 I hear you. Is that better? It is perfect. You sounded like Mickey Hi. Mouse. <laughs> I'm not using any kind of special effects there at all. So I thought you were purposely trying to make me laugh, and I appreciate no. it. No, it was a good, healthy laugh. <laughs> but you don't sound like Mickey Mouse anymore. No, I've only used it once. Oh yeah, well, and thank you for agreeing to use it a second time. Okay, so I am going to introduce us and start the show. Okay. Okay. My name is Arlene J.M. Grant, and we are now going to have another episode of God and Matter. And today we have James Beale as our guest. James is a bookseller, among other things. James, thank you for coming. And why don't you tell the people, because you know best, who are you? Well, thank you for inviting me on uh, my first time doing a podcast. I have a small foreign language bookshop here in the uh, suburbs of Washington, D.C. and Maryland. We specialize in materials from Russia, Poland, Ukraine, and basically in addition to just individuals uh, studying or those who speak the language, uh, we specialize in providing textbooks to universities, schools, private language schools, government language schools for folks learning, learning the languages. That's incredible. So your bookstore serves schools and you do it internationally. I know that uh, you and I met, I think you took one of my photography workshops. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we've stayed in touch since. And that was a good experience, helping you to see through the lens. And I am also thankful because you also photographed me. James Beale is a very good photographer and good human. So with your bookstore, what kinds of books do you sell exactly? If you ignore the fact that what we have is in different languages we're just like your every other normal day uh independent bookstore we have children's books we have fiction we have uh books on history we have books on military history biography the same range of titles that any normal bookstore would have it's just that ours happen to be in multiple languages great are you able to operate that business now we have been closed to the public now for three weeks since the initial order by the state of Maryland to close the schools and to start social distancing. Because my wife and I are the caretakers for her elderly parents, I decided that if the school should be closed, then I should probably also close the shop to, to people coming into the store to purchase. And of course, now in the state of Maryland, all non-essential businesses have been ordered to close, uh, meaning that that you can't have people inside your shop. It doesn't mean you can't continue to work. And in our case, because we also have, in addition to our physical bookstore, we've had for many years an online presence. It just means that I'm trying to move people to order online and I'm continuing to ship those uh, orders to, to individuals. Unfortunately, our public library or university uh, clients they are also under lockdown, and so we're unable to ship titles to them at this point. They've asked us to hold on to those books until the time that they can reopen. Uh, so it's a very tough time to be a bookstore because, you know, obviously cash flow issues. I have, you know, books uh, that I've purchased for libraries that I cannot send to them, and they cannot receive, which means they cannot pay, which means I cannot pay the supplier. So it's kind of a very horrible, perfect storm of things. And... Um, yeah, that's kind of where we are right now. I'm sorry that you're in that situation. Uh, you mentioned about driving people to your, your online presence. What is that website address that I can share with people listening? Our main uh, web store is just, uh, well, obviously, www.russia-on-line.com. We try to keep it uh, an exact mirror of the titles we do have in the physical bookstore. So anything that is online is something that we, we do have in the shop and is ready to, to ship out. I'm still coming in Monday through Friday, uh, not necessarily working the same hours because <laughs> there's not much point in that, but still trying to keep, you know, for my own sanity, uh, a somewhat regular schedule and an ability to, to mail things out uh, on a daily basis as they, as, you know, as orders come in, we ship them out. So. That's great. And I do want to go back to something you said. You, you've made a decision to protect your family, to shudder at the first order that uh, the governor of Maryland, who is Governor Hogan, authorized, which shuttered the schools. And that was very responsible of you. Early action, they're saying, is able to curb and flatten the curve. So mm. I 
attribute the flattening of the curve to you as well that is not as bad in Maryland because books carry people. Um, you know, you touch a book, you leave your print on it. And, and you know, bookstores, you know, bookstores are those type of stores that people who, you know, obviously, you know, there's Amazon, but you know, a lot of book people love the physical contact of books uh, and when they're selecting a book to read. And so, you know, it was not a decision I took lightly to, uh, to, to close. Uh, to the public. You know, one of the things that was guiding me at the time, and I think one of the most frustrating things about this whole experience in this pandemic has been the fact that it seems every country keeps doing the same mistakes that the country in front of it did as it approaches the disease. And I remember when they started to close the schools that the data from the deep testing that they had done in South Korea showed that a lot of, especially younger people, were infectious but asymptomatic. Yes. Um, and that combined with the order to close the schools, given that, you know, um, you know, my mother-in-law is uh, undergoing chemo and had just completed a bone marrow transplant and my father-in-law is 93 years old, given the fact that a lot of people are asymptomatic but infectious, I decided that it was, you know, the best thing to do was to go ahead and close. And, and, and what do we see now in the last couple of days? Now here they're thinking about revising how they tell people to wear masks or not to wear a mask because they're beginning to realize that one in four people who are infected are indeed asymptomatic, which is why this thing is spreading so fast and so far because you have a whole bunch of typhoid Marys walking around who don't know they have the disease. That's true. Uh, we've had mixed reports from the government. One moment they're saying, don't wear a mask if you're not sick. The next minute they're saying, okay, maybe we should, maybe we should have learned from China's model to say everyone should wear a mask. Um, but I feel like we as a country are behind and we're supposed to be a superpower and a world leader, but we we're mm. behind and there were so many warnings. There was a warning in December when it happened in China. We have international trade. There should have been this awareness to say, hey, you know what? We have people that are coming in and out of China. If China has this sickness, there's a possibility that we're going to bring it home, yeah. correct? So it was yeah. kind of a no-brainer. And then this idea, there was this false report from the president that was saying, you know, it'll be 15 and then zero. Well, that 15 has multiplied uh, thousands of times. And it's unfortunate now that when people are, are dying and at the rate in which they're dying and the rate in which they're being infected, the truth now comes out. And they're saying in the best case scenario, the amount of people right now that are infected are the only amount of people to die you know, or maybe a hundred thousand more than that. That's and, not necessarily settling for a lot of people. Well, and, and especially because even as horrible as the numbers are officially of the number of people who are infected, the reality is that it's probably five, six, seven, eight, maybe even 10 times that amount that are actually infected because it's probably already way into the millions of people who, who are actually infected with, with this disease. There's just been no testing. I mean, here in Maryland, if the official Maryland website, uh, coronavirus update website, is the official record of the number of tests that have been done, for a state of about six and a half million people, I don't think we've even done 20,000 tests. It's just nothing. It's nothing. It's, it's, it's like driving down the road with your eyes closed. It, it, it has, tells you nothing. That's and, there are no, and there are no tests available. Yeah, I think that's why the governor made that hard decision on Monday to say, you know what? This is an order. I'm not asking you nicely anymore. Stay at home. And I think that's important. And when you talk about the fact that most people won't know that they have it, I think it's true. But to make one distinction, because coronavirus is one thing, and then COVID-19 is another. So I think that, you know, some people are like, you can have the virus, but then it becomes COVID-19 to become the disease. So two different things that are at work. And I think some people don't understand that. Now, I'm not a scientist. My brother is a doctor, but I'm not. I just read. Um, and I try to read international news, not limiting myself to what's coming on in the U.S. and New Zealand. I think, you know, that's like my country and heart. I love New Zealand. And so I pay attention to what they put out. And they put out a lot of good information uh, that you get more of the truth of what's going to happen. 
But enough about coronavirus and, and the statistics and all of that. But one thing about it that you, you shared that disturbed me was about international trade. How is international I, trade happening now? Because you have an online presence, but I understood you're not even able to get the merchandise now. It's really going to be, it's unclear for right now, especially short term, what's going to happen. Uh, most of what we you know, it's just the nature of the global economy at this point is that nobody really keeps huge inventories. And as a small business, I, I'm not that dissimilar to the giant multinationals because I, first of all, don't have the pockets to just buy a lot of copies of books in the hopes that they're all going to sell. And especially with air cargo, there's no need for me to keep a lot of copies of things when I can get them in two weeks. But what we've seen with this virus uh, in this pandemic is the almost complete collapse of international air travel. Major airlines reducing routes, uh, reducing the number of flights they do on those routes, uh, in some cases up to 95% cuts to their international routes. And what people may or may not know is that cargo travels on a lot of planes. It's not just dedicated cargo planes. Every passenger plane flying around the country or across the nation, across the globe, is carrying cargo. You know, that's part of the way these airlines are making money. And with the collapse of these uh, routes and flights, theoretically, there's still, even in, in the downturn there is right now, there is still uh, a large amount of air cargo, but there just isn't a lot of way to move that cargo. And so what we're looking at is disruptions to the supply chain, disruptions to air cargo, that's either going to be dramatic increases in price. Uh, for right now, for example, uh, at least for the foreseeable week, all the airports in, in Russia are shut down. So there's no planes leaving or coming in. So, you know, no, no books or trade is going on, at least by airplane from, from Russia at this point. And I guess that would include uh, even mail. I mean, how's air mail going to fly if there's no air, <laughs> air component to that? This is going to take a, you know, if we're looking at, you know, disruptions and each country is in a different place in this whole thing. You know, some countries are going to be coming out of it sooner than others, but that doesn't mean that they're going to be able to reinstitute whatever trade connections they have, because if their trading partner is still deep in this, then, you know, there's not going to be those ties. So, you know, long term, this is going to have, it's unknown what it's going to have, especially for, you know, folks like me who, you know, we import, that's what we do. And so it's going to be unclear, you know, are we going to have to go back to containers, sea shipping, which, you know, is cheaper. People like to have new books now and not three weeks later, four weeks later, five weeks later, if you're dealing with containers on ships, it's not as fast. That's true. And it's slowing things down. It's using slow travel now. So it's important to me, and, and part of the reason why I invited you on, beyond being an awesome person, is that what you're doing is important and we need books. I mean, books are how we learn, there's stories, there's information, and you're a small business. And oftentimes we think, okay, well, we'll go to Amazon and get it, or Barnes and Noble and get it. But the small guy, the mom and pop, they need attention, they need love too. So again, your website is Russia dash on dash line.com correct 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 okay what resources are out there for small booksellers like yourself are you aware of any help measures yes and we do have books in english i mean not everything is in russian but we do have books in english uh but they're you know we're we're a member of the american booksellers association which is the association for independent bookstores in the united states and there is a charity the it's called bink i'm blinking out right now on what the acronym stands for but mm -hmm. they are providing uh they do scholarships when things are normal they help they do scholarships for booksellers people who work at bookstores to help pay for part of their university maybe and right now during this crisis they are doing grants to booksellers who are not able to work right now. And they're also reaching out and trying to help bookstores. So that's one way that uh, bookstores are, are trying to help each other, you know, through this uh, charitable organization. There's also kind of a competitor to Amazon, bookshop.org. And they are taking 
10% of their sales and those get kicked back into ind independent bookstores to help them. And then of course, uh, the new legislation that was passed by the U.S. government is also offering, you know, support and help to small, small businesses. State of Maryland is also doing a program for the same thing. And so, you know, we're applying, you know, to the federal program and we'll see what happens with that. Studying the state of Maryland's program right now, I'm not sure, I, I don't want to double dip uh, i'm trying to figure out what the rules are for if you're applying for one program do you apply for the other one does it disqualify you it's all so happening fast you know that uh but those are the resources available to small businesses and to some bookstores in, in particular okay that's great now what about you as a person uh, you talked about your in-laws and their age and i know your uh, mother-in-law is going through chemo i didn't i'm glad that she had the safe transplant for the bone marrow i remember that was going to happen and i didn't follow up with you on that so i'm glad that is well how are you managing as a family and an extended family under these circumstances how is your life impacted mm -hmm. um you know um it's ironic. One of the ways that I've always, um, that has helped me manage stress in my life has been, you know, being very active, uh, physically training and working out. And, uh, you know, I've been training jujitsu for some time and that has, that has helped. But of course, jujitsu is very close physical contact with somebody and that's something we can't do right now in this this environment so unfortunately my main uh, way of, of keeping stress under control has you know is is, is a big no-no one of the things you learn uh with jujitsu is that it's not always about you there are some things that you know you, you kind of have to keep your ego in check and uh, so i look at this and i know there's a lot of stuff that will make you very frustrated especially when you see a lot of dumb things happening and there's you know there's just things that aren't in our control and it's tough to remind yourself of that i kind of know that there are things that i can control and things that i can't and so i try to focus on what is it that i can control my risk my exposure my risk of exposing other people and so i try to focus on that i try you know and it's tough you know i'm not gonna say it's easy but you know it's it's what i try to do i've got my own mom is by herself you know in texas and my brother is in the, the heart of the beast right now in new york city and um you know you all you can do is reach out to people all you can do is try to talk and and just keep yourself as grounded as possible in this time of insanity is all you can do that's about it so that's true all you can do is to ground yourself um, ultimately being whole allows you to take care of yourself and others so what are you doing jiu-jitsu you mentioned you can't do and you and i have discussion independently you're trying to figure out how you can exercise so what have you settled upon if anything i'm uh, trying to you know trying to set up a routine and it, part of that is is trying to keep as normal a routine as possible and that is getting up you know making coffee eating breakfast going coming into the bookstore and trying to keep as much of a normal as possible trying to develop a new exercise routine which is not easy you know this is like everybody else especially in this part of the country you know i had a <laughs> my google calendar was never empty there was always something going on whether it was my training uh my son's hockey games uh his hockey training my wife's hockey games something's always going on and now nothing is <laughs> nothing is going on so it's tough to make a new routine in these crazy times and that's what i'm trying to do and um you know maybe when this is all over i'll just kind of like collapse into a pile of jelly but i can't do that right now because uh, you know i've got to take care of too many people i've got to try to keep my business alive and i just i don't have it's a luxury I, I can't afford to do you know I, if i was working for a big corporation and no matter what they were paying my salary i don't know maybe i'd drink wine all day or something or just you know have a my own little breakdown but i wouldn't have to worry about keeping a company alive but i do so i plan what i'm doing in the office i you know plan the meals i do the cooking so and because i don't want anybody else taking the risk of going to the grocery stores i make sure that gets done and try to do that as infrequently as possible to minimize risk so i just try to focus on all the tasks that i have at hand and just not give myself a chance to i don't know <laughs> fall apart that'll come later <laughs> I am so proud of who you are, um, and that's such an honor to know who you are. I love that you are protecting your family 
and I, I know that it's a lot of responsibility. So I would encourage you at the most, if not the least, to just practice your breathing to get good air in for yourself when you have those moments to still yourself, maybe some essential oils. I don't know if you tried that, but um, some essential oils. And then also I was telling a guest, I did a show just before yours about putting olive oil inside your nasal passage. I don't know if you know about this, but in the old days, they used to put like Vaseline inside their nose and oil. And mm -hmm. I remember like in the 80s or something like that, I, they used to tell you, you put vitamin E oil inside your nostrils, it protects you during flu season from catching whatever's in the air. So make sure you're keeping your passage, you know, lubricated there and your skin moisturized as well to protect you as you go out there on the front lines for your family. That's important. Especially moisturizer on your hands because when you're washing your hands <laughs> every 10 minutes there's not much skin left on them so no it's not i actually have like a little thing of cream right here beside me <laughs> i've got olive oil right here <laughs> you have to keep moist you know um yes. it's important um and also just the quiet you know the quiet in the midst of the loudness that's going on i think my being able to come into my store and, you know, my son is, is doing, you know, now that the schools are moving to online and trying to get that all focused and my wife is, you know, working on the, on the dining room table with her stuff. I think it, in a way it's kind of a lucky thing that I can come into the store. So everybody has a little bit of space. You know, you see the funny memes about, you know, the, the Hollywood star saying, oh, you know, just self-quarantine. And then they show these ginormous houses with pools and everything else, right? Well, we don't have that. But I think my being able to come here gives me a sense of normality, gives me some quiet, it gives everybody space. I, you know, my brother is in a very tiny New York apartment and he's by himself, but given the size of his apartment, it's probably a good thing he's by himself because <laughs> I think he would go crazy. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> it's you know, it's like the, the play no exit if you were kind of going to be locked up for months and not being able to, to get out of the house. So, How is your brother managing it? I mean, it is the epicenter in the U.S. How does he manage that, like, emotionally? It's, it's been tough on him, you know. Um, uh, you know, he worked at a bar, so the bars are all closed. So he's technically unemployed uh at this point because of the virus but you know bars are a high contact area so it's probably a good thing you know but uh you know he's he's pretty resilient he's kind of a hard crusty guy so i'm, I'm sure he's you know he's gonna go stir crazy probably but um you know he's got he's got his cats and uh he's a big 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 uh, movie guy so i'm sure he's just watching movies <laughs> that's good and then you said your mom is in texas how's she doing uh she's doing okay you know as this was all hitting she was finalizing a, a move uh and so she's in her new place and she's settled in and she's she's taking advantage of this uh just unpacking and getting everything the way she wants it she's able to get uh food delivered the local grocery store there in texas heb uh has been pretty awesome and you know they were you know they, they've come out looking very well in this uh, in this pandemic as far as they're planning for their own stores and everything else it's a local texas chain and so she's able to get what she needs and she's fine with that and uh obviously she probably would like to be closer to us but you know she also knows that it's better that she stay where she is for right now so but it's tough it's tough you know because drive around or you look around and you see people not social distancing which is why i think the governor also made this decision on monday you know after the nice weather on sunday people were just clustered up at the parks and they were you know doing all the things that they're not supposed to be doing and if we're going to get out of this people have to kind of obey those rules it's interesting you mentioned that about the people not obeying the rules i was actually at uh, brookside gardens uh, doing some photography and i was keeping like double social distance right and i saw people cough without covering their mouths or even doing it in their elbow I've seen them sneeze and then just keep walking. I'm like, you know, this is crazy. So yeah. I was kind of looking around Sunday, like these people don't get it. I don't think they understand what this is. I'm not fearful. I don't feel like I'm at risk. And I don't feel like I'm at risk just because my faith foundation and all that. And I take care of myself and I 
also want to help other people. So I keep my distance, right? They said you're supposed to act like you have it. Yeah. That's what I heard. Yeah. So I act like I have it. Go in, you know, I go in the grocery store, I clean my hands. Before I go in, when I leave, like my car, I clean my hands. When I get in the store, I clean my hands. Before I leave, I clean my hands. You know, I've heard some stories, they're saying people are getting it from their grocery packaging. I don't know, but I do take hand sanitizer. I usually ask the cashier, I'm like, oh, do you have hand sanitizer? And they usually yeah. have it there. And I'm like, I don't want to hold their bottle. I'm like, could like, you give me a squirt? And I just wipe things down with my hands really quickly. Uh, you know, I'm not using the gloves when I go out. Maybe I should, I don't know, but yeah. I I just find like I'm just trying to, to, to be diligent for myself and others. And yeah. that keeps me calm. I have peacefulness about this. I don't have stress about it. What advice would you give somebody dealing with this situation from your perspective as a small business, uh, a father, a husband, a son-in-law, a son, a brother? What would you do as a man yourself? <laughs> I, th I think, um, you know, it's tough because I, I think about, you know, well, what happens if I can't keep my business alive because of this, you know? And I think as much as we tend to look inward on things, we have to remember that we're not the only ones going through this. And some people are going through a lot worse, right? And if my business fails because of this, it, it doesn't mean that I'm a failure. And I think people to stay sane in all of this need to realize that, you know, this is something that once in a century, <laughs> I mean, it, I know it feels like, um, uh, you know, I know it feels like since 9-11 that we've had something every five years, it seems, <laughs> every eight years or something, you know, that this is like a uh, yet another plague of locusts or something that has come down. But, but, you know, this is in reality, this is something that if all of the, you know, quote unquote, responsible people around the world didn't plan for and cannot stop, it's not something that you or I on the street can stop. But what we can do is do what's expected of us to not make it worse, but also realize that the things that are happening around us, whether it's your job is gone or you can't work at the restaurant or your bookstore or whatever, is that it's bigger than us. And we are not to blame for these bad things. We have to deal with it, but we didn't cause this. And you have to just kind of try to stay as positively focused as possible. Bad stuff is going to happen without you thinking about it. It's just going to happen. But good stuff usually requires a little bit more input. Good stuff usually just doesn't happen. You know, you have to kind of help it. You don't have to help bad stuff. Bad stuff is going to happen with or without you. So try to help the good stuff. That's sound advice. A lot of times people do worry, especially those who are more sensitive at heart than others. And, you know, it can be overwhelming to take a look or to be experiencing these different things. And one of the things I'm mindful of is to tell people, you know, you can only fix what's in, within your control, whether mm -hmm. you meditate, pray, you just put your mind to it and you grind whatever it is that you're doing to take care of you and your responsibilities to the best of your ability. Things will fall into place. It's not the end of the world. It might be the end of something that you used to do. And it might be the end of a moment, it might be an opportunity for reflection, it might be an opportunity to revamp your business. For example, you might decide you want to deal with independent authors and say, you know, why don't I market your ebooks for you? And people can buy them from my website. You know, someone can do that. Or you could say, gee, you know, we can't do hockey today, but maybe we can do like virtual hockey or something like that mm -hmm. using the skill the talent i'm not sure or some virtual jujitsu i'm not sure if that exists <laughs> but i'm not really a gamer but i do value the importance of play but i appreciate your resilience james thank you so much uh, for being here i didn't ask you the one thing but it almost seems like from what you've said you've answered it with implicitly without it being said directly which is what inspires you, what motivates you. I'm guessing family and love. Um, what would your answer be? You know, <clears throat> family is important and love is important. And, and I think, um, you know, tomorrow's got to be a better day. I hope that it will be for you and your family.
Not for I all of us. Many, many blessings. And thank you so much for your time and agreeing to be on the show. If you, if you had like a favorite quote, do you have a favorite quote or something like that that you want to share to close out? Love words and books. Not, not, nothing that, 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 that comes to mind right now. Um, well, if you want to send it to me um, okay. after, I'll include it in the edit for the show. I mean, the, the only, only, I was talking to somebody the other day, and, and, and the quote I was talking about was from All the King's Men, but I don't think that's relevant right now. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> You're not very uplifting, you know, that uh, uh, a man is born in sin, and from the stink of the deity to the stink of the shroud, you know, no, that's, let's not talk about that. That's... <laughs> <laughs> That's not <Okay>. very motivating. <laughs> All right. But um, I think that you have motivated people with your courage and your commitment and your story. And I know you will avail yourself of whatever resources that exist. And creating a plan is really important to managing the unknown. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I say creating a plan and managing the unknown, it means at least you can account for yourself and your responsibilities, and then maybe it works exactly how you planned it, maybe it doesn't. But at least you have some effort that goes forth. Maybe it's to say, I'm eating a carrot today, and that is my plan. And applaud yourself for eating that carrot, you know? It can, it can be that simple. Yes, it can be. Thanks so much, James, and thanks no, you no for problem. doing this. I'll talk no, with no you, okay? Okay. Thanks, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. So what'd you think? I enjoyed that. James did send his favorite quote from Masters and Margarita. Let's have a listen. The tongue may hide the truth, but the eyes never. Mikhail Bulgakov, the Master and Margarita. We recorded this episode quite some time ago, actually when I first started God and Matter, and it's still relevant. We're still dealing with a pandemic, and times are a little bit even more out of our control but people are taking control to make change. And that is one of the things I like about James. In addition to the fact that he runs his own business and family is his priority, he's donating birthday gifts to the Equal Justice Initiative. He learned about the Equal Justice Initiative from reading a book, kind of appropriate for a bookseller. James taught some really important lessons and one of them is to always think about how you are impacting others, to try to do whatever you can do within your power. And if you can't manage it and you can't control it, don't let that overwhelm you. So in the two months, what's happened with James? James has actually made some change. He ended up getting his loan that he needed, wonderful. He also has started to pivot, and with that he creates greeting cards through his business. He has donated art and he's using his personal photography through russia-on-line.com. You are able to purchase greeting cards and support him. I encourage you to do so. Next time on God and Matter, our guest is our niece Green. Our niece and her twin are both realtors. Our niece is tearing up the real estate market. She's listing, she is selling, she's serving buyers, she's doing seminars, she's on fire. Our niece is a mother as well as a wife, and her story is impressive. I encourage you to listen to our niece's story in the next episode. God and Matter is produced by Arlie Speaks Media LLC. Arlie Speaks Media LLC does not receive sponsors for God and Matter. We may, however, add merchandise and opportunities to donate but we are not a sponsored program with commercials. Our position is love, doing everything in love. God and Matter is available at youtube.com and distributed by castbox.fm. Please visit our website, godandmatter.com, to learn more about the show or me, your host, Arlene J.M. Grant. Until next time, thank you so much for listening, subscribing, sharing, and do be well.